continue with this uh, theme of the glory of God going to all nations. Before I do that, I'm going to pass this clipboard around. This clipboard uh, is for a couple purposes. Number one, uh, my wife and I always request prayer for each time I travel. There's about 1,600 people on the list, uh, and they all knew about the baby. And uh, so uh, if you would like to be on that list, uh, please give me your name, email address, print very clearly. Put a check mark here. Also, my wife and I take teams overseas. We're going to Peru to do church planting out in the villages. And so if you want to be a part of that, put a check mark over here. Uh, and then no more homeschool options over here. So I'm going to, uh, if you could start this all the way over on that side, please, that would be great. Uh, actually, take it all the way over there. That would be great. Thank you so much. Okay, we're going to start uh, this second hour by telling you about Corey Ten Boom. Most of you know about Corrie Ten Boom. She was a woman who, uh, she and her family, they tried to protect Jews during World War II. The Nazis found out about her and her family. They then uh, put them all in, in the prison camps, the, the, um, the Nazi prison camps. And uh, they all died off except for Corrie. Corrie got let out because of a clerical error because of one of the secretaries. After the war, she began to travel around and speak about God's grace and goodness to her despite all of that. As she was traveling around at 81 years of age, she met a man by the name of Floyd McClung. Floyd McClung was a on staff with a man, and he noticed that she had just purchased brand new luggage. So he said, Corey, why did you get brand new luggage? She said, oh, an angel of the Lord appeared to me last night and told me that I've got 10 more years to live, so I'm going to celebrate it. Bought brand new luggage. He said, that's wonderful. Five years later, he finds Corey in the hospital. She's in tremendous pain and agony, suffering terribly. And as she is suffering terribly, Floyd talks with her, and she says, the angel of the Lord appeared to me again last night. He said, oh yeah, what did the angel say? She said, the angel told me that the pain and the suffering that I'm going through is going to result in my death. Now, I gotta do a little parenthetical thought here. Stephen, is my camp over? Yes, sir. Great, thank you. So she says, it's going to result in my death. But Corey said to the angel, angel, I've got five more years to live. The angel said, yes, your heavenly father knows this, and he sent me here to tell you that he's willing to take you home early. Now, what would you want to do? You're in a hospital bed, you're in tremendous pain and agony, you're suffering, and it's going to result until your death, and your heavenly father says he's going to be willing to take you home early. What would your response be? out of here. Here's what Corey said. What will bring my father the most glory? Staying in suffering or going home early? The angel said staying in suffering. Corey said then I'll stay and I'll suffer. The last five years of Corey Ten Boom's life was spent in a hospital bed of tremendous pain and agony, suffering terribly. Corey understood James chapter 2, 1 through 4 that said, Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of any kind. Why joy? Because of what Corey got out of it? No, Corey, like a dog, said, Corey lived to radiate her father's glory. And because she lived to radiate her father's glory, she found joy in glorifying her God. Which makes us ask a very challenging question. And that question is, how much glory do we want to give to God? Do we want to give God some glory? Do we want to give Him a lot of glory? Do we want to give Him tremendous glory? Or do we want to give Him maximum glory? Now I knew the crowd last night wanted to give God maximum glory because they were there while the Super Bowl was being played. You guys, I really don't know, but I'll assume that you want to bring your God, your Father, maximum glory. How do we do that? Well, we found out in the last lecture we do that because it has everything to do with world evangelization. When we ask a very different question, the average question most Christians ask in the world evangelization is, what do the Muslims get out of it? What do the Buddhists get out of it? What do the Hindus get out of it? Oh, they don't, they don't go to hell. They get to go to heaven. But dogs ask a very different question. Dogs say, what does God get out of it? What does God get out of it? Yeah, what does God get when there are people from every tongue, every tribe, and every nation worshiping him? Well, we looked at what happens to your vision of God when you worship God with people from other cultures. God reveals more of His glory. God reveals greater glory by unifying that which is diverse. We talked about that. We then said you add more diversity, 
and more of God's glory is revealed. The more you add diversity, the more of His glory is revealed. And this is why, again, God said, I want people from every tongue, tribe, and nation. Because when you and I are there with every tongue, tribe, and nation, He'll not only get glory, as if He reached the Jews only, and only get greater glory, as if He reached the Jews and a few Gentile groups. No, then and only then will God get the greatest glory from mankind as we know it. I want to continue to challenge you. This is the true, driving, motivating force for world evangelization. And that is to reveal your Father's greatest glory from mankind as we know it. Now, probably the majority of Christians, especially evangelicals, have a primary motivation for world evangelization to... Anybody want to guess what it is? Save people from hell. It's still all about people. I'm trying to switch your focus from the me side of the cross. The me says it's all about me, but the me side of the cross says it's all about people. People are the main focus. We want to say, no, it's about God. What does God get? He gets that greater glory. So I'm switching, hopefully, in your mind, the focus from we're out there to save the lost to, no, we're out there to bring our Father to glory. Two different motivations. Oh, how that can save you on the mission field uh, when you're in challenging times. And again, we found this hint of that. Genesis 1.28. Fill the earth. God bless humanity, mankind, and set them be fruitful and increase. Fill the earth. What happens to our language when we fill the earth? It begins to break down. Again, I'm challenging God intended to create diversity, to bring it back together in harmony, to reveal His greatest glory. This is what I call the story of of the Bible. The story of the Bible. Now I never understood the Bible this way because I was taught the Bible to be 66 independent books with various themes and messages and woven throughout it. And when I went to my Bible study leader, I said, well, how do you study the Bible? And I was a freshman in college when I became a Christian. He said, I don't know. You want to study the books of the Bible? I said, I don't know what to start with. What book should I start with? He said, I don't know. Choose something in the New Testament. So I chose Galatians. I said, now what do I do? He said, read through it a bunch of times. So I read through Galatians 4 or 5 times. I said, what am I really looking for here? He said, you want to find one key verse that everything hinges off of. I said, come on, I got the Thompson Chain reference. It tells you right in the back. So I found out what the one key verse was. I said, now what do I do? He said, study every one verse in light of that one key verse. So I studied every one verse in light of that one key verse. And I found out what Galatians was all about. Not only justification by grace, but sanctification by grace as well. Well, I got kind of excited because I understood what a book of the Bible was all about. So then I went to Ephesians, learned what that book was all about. I was on such a roll. I went to Revelation. God bless just because I read the book. And I began to study book after book after book in the Bible. And someone finally stopped me and said, hey, have you ever studied your Bible as one book? I said, no, what do you mean? He said, well, this is every one book has an introduction and a story and a conclusion. So your Bible has an introduction. So your Bible has a story. And so your Bible has a conclusion. I said, I've never studied that. And I got introduced to the story of the Bible. The story of the Bible. Now, we're not talking about Bible stories. We all know Bible stories. David and Goliath, Daniel and the Lions. We're not talking about those. We're talking about one overall arching theme that starts in an introduction, goes all the way through to a conclusion, and makes everything in the middle the story. The introduction is found in Genesis chapter 1 to Genesis chapter 11. The story starts in Genesis 12, goes all the way through Revelation 4, and the conclusion is found in Revelation chapter 5 and goes to the very end. We are going to begin with the introduction. You all know the very basics to the introduction. God creates mankind. Mankind falls into sin. God takes care of the sin. Mankind begins to grow and multiply. As he grows and multiplies, every intention of man's heart is evil. Men and women, sin can reach a point where God says, that's it. God, being a holy God, could not put up with all that sin. He brought about a judgment. Noah and his family get into the ark for 40 days and 40 nights. It rains. A year later, they crash. After they crash, God gives them a rainbow and says, Noah, I am never going to do that again on the face of the earth. Mankind begins to grow and multiply more. And as he grows more, you know, you can come to every one of my talks. I love your laughter. You keep laughing. That's my daughter. How old was Elise, honey, when she did this one? About eight years old, nine years old. She did it. So you keep on laughing. You keep coming. You are. You can come to every one of my talks. I'll give you a ticket and you can come. 
So anyhow, God gives the rainbow, and then he says in Genesis 9, 1, of course, God bless Noah and said to his son to be fruitful and increase in number and do what? Fill the earth. He's on the same game plan. He wants to create diversity so we can bring them back together in harmony to reveal his no, his greatest glory. Exactly. And then mankind begins to grow and multiply. We saw mankind grow and multiply. We got to Genesis chapter 11, 1. We saw that that was very key. It said, now the whole world had one language and a common speech. See, if you remember this, at this point in time, there was no us, them mentality. There was no us, them mentality. There's only us. One people, one nation, one language, one culture. Okay, if they had the opening ceremony of the Olympics back in those days, it was a very short opening ceremony. A bunch of buses would come in, and they'd put their flag down, and then they'd play in murals. Why? Because there's no other them for them to play. There was only us's. Which means at this point in the history of mankind, be careful, we've done this once, let's do it again. At this point in the history of mankind, God had the potential for revealing His? No, His. One group of people. He had the potential for revealing His? Glory, but not his greatest glory, because there's no other thems. And we saw, they said to each other, come, let us make bricks and make them thoroughly. They used brick instead of stone and tar for mortar. Then they said, come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens, so that we might make a name for ourselves and not be scattered over the face of the whole earth. I want to challenge you that God saw three major problems arise. Problem number one. He knew that Satan, with one lie, could mislead them all. With one lie, Satan could mislead them all. Problem number two. Pride was welling up inside of these people. Pride was welling up inside of these people. Let us make grace. Let us build ourselves and say that we might make a name for ourselves. And we all know what pride does to our relationship with God. Pride breaks our relationship with God. We then saw that there was disobedience welling up inside of the people. They said, let us not be scattered over the face of the whole earth. God said, be fruitful, multiply, scatter. They said, no way. We're going to stay one people. We are not going to scatter. Seeing these three major problems, knowing that their sin could come to a point where it would be judged, already having given the promise of the rainbow, God did in one moment what should have taken centuries to do. He took their one language and he broke it down into many different languages. That's why it's, of course, called the Tower of Babel. And instead of being an act of judgment, it's much more an act of mercy. God, not wanting to destroy the people, simply divided up their languages so we could later reach out to them in the gospel. And that ends the introduction to the story of the Bible. If we were watching this in a theater, the curtains would close at this point in time. We'd go out, get some Coke and popcorn, put it all down. The lights would flick on and off. And we'd come back in and we would begin the story of the Bible. Let me read to you the beginning of the story of the Bible from the newly edited Children Revised Living Version. or something like this. God was up in the heavens. He saw approximately 70 different linguistic groups down on the face of the earth. Now how do we get the number 70? We get the number 70 because Genesis 10 has a listing of the families. And there are 70 listings there. But wait, Genesis 10 precedes Genesis chapter 11. Well, yes, it does. But when Hebrew writers want to write about something significant, they write about it twice. Creation was written about in Genesis 1 and in Genesis 2. Tower of Babel, Genesis 10 and Genesis 11. 70 distinct ethnic groups created the Tower of Babel. God, loving every one of them equally, wanted to reach out to them. And he could have spoken the gospel in 70 different languages. After all, he made those languages. But he chose not to do that. Instead, he chose to use mankind to reach out to mankind so he could train mankind in the process to rule and to reign with him for all of eternity. So he reached out and he picked up one man. And he said to that one man, Look, Abe, buddy, I want to bless you. In fact, I want to bless your socks off. I want to be your God. I want you to be my people. I want to pour out my grace, my mercy, my love upon you. And the reason I want to bless you, Abraham, is not so you can simply sit back in a soft, comfortable, cushiony chair saying, Oh, praise the Lord, I have been blessed. Abraham, that's not incorrect, but it's grossly incomplete. 
I want you to turn around and be a blessing to all the groups of people I created at the Tower of Babel. I want to bless you so you can be a blessing. Now we find this in the covenant that God gave to Abraham. You studied it last week. It's called the Abrahamic covenant. He says, I'll make you into a great nation and I will bless you. I will make your name great and you'll be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, who curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Now you can go to some commentaries online or in your, in your home uh, commentaries and find out that there are theologians who will break this covenant down into five parts. Others break it down into four major parts. Others three. We at Unveiling Glory with the mentoring, the mentoring of Don Richardson say this covenant breaks down into two very simple basic parts. We call them the top line of the covenant and the bottom line of the covenant. The top line of the covenant is the fact that God wants to bless us. God is a God who wants to bless. That's who He is. That's His character. That's a part of how He reveals His glory. He wants to bless us with time, gifts, talents, energy, friends, homes, cars, careers, bank accounts. But most of all, Himself. A relationship with Him. Being in His presence. Being so satisfied you don't want to leave. God wants to bless us. But never are the blessings solely for us. We don't go around like a bucket and just say, God bless me, God bless me, God bless me. Rather, God sees through us to others. God knows whom he wants you to bless next week, next year. And so we take him in a pipe, we enjoy him, and we pass him out through the rest of the pipe. Blessing others. Giving us bottom line responsibilities. The responsibility to go around and be a blessing. But where do the responsibilities go? Well, the covenant was very specific. He said peoples. P-E-O-P-L-E-S. That is not a typo on the screen. You should have learned last week. But that is a unique word. Tongues, tribes, ethnic groups, people groups, families, nations. Translated in many different ways. But when you use the word nations through you, Abram, all nations on earth shall be blessed, you miss the meaning entirely. Because, for example, Pakistan is one nation in our English language. But in God's eyes, there are many distinct groups of people in Pakistan. Many groups of people that call us, us, and the others, them. You've got the Beel, the Sindhi, the Baluch, the Punjabi, the Pushtun, the Shinas, the Sravi, the Kashmiri, the Malti. Every one of those groups of people calls us, us, and the others, thems. And if the gospel were to break out among the Punjabi, it's going to have a tendency to stay among the Punjabi. Not going to go to the field, not going to go to the city, not going to go to the other groups. Why? They're thems. I don't hang around them. I only hang around us. So the gospel has a tendency to stay within its own group of people. I mean, look around. We're all basically a bunch of us. Pretty much. 98% of us. God knew this. So we put in one word to Abram and changed everything. Through you, Abram. All, A-L-L, -L, all peoples on earth shall be blessed. Which means what we've got here in Genesis chapter 12, verses 2 and 3 is for all practical purposes, the great commission. Go therefore make disciples of all nations. Through you, Abram, all peoples on earth shall be blessed. All nations, all peoples, synonyms for the same thing. Now for the longest time, I always thought Jesus gave the great commission as if it was a previously undisclosed purpose of God. How many of you walking in here before you took this course thought Jesus gave the Great Commission for the very first time? Was your hands? Yeah, so did I. But I was wrong. Why? I read my Bible in 66 independent books. I thought every book was about me. And I never saw the overall story. Jesus never initiated the idea of reaching all nations. He reviewed it. And it begins here in Genesis chapter 12, verses 2 and 3. And silently, but now and powerfully, it begins to weave its way through the entire word of God. Allowing us to read God's word as one book, one story, one theme. All the way through God's word. Now don't miss the big picture. What's the big picture? God wants to use people. He wants to use you to reach nations. Now at this point, every time I'm talking, I always talk about my elephant in the room question. Everybody knows what an elephant in the room question is. Something you don't want to talk about that's pretty obvious that no one really wants to address. What do we want to? What are we? What are we trying to avoid? Let me try to help you out. 
How many of you have ever seen or heard uh, of Muslims coming to know Jesus through dreams, signs, or wonders? How many of you have heard of Look at the majority. Okay, let's ask the obvious question no one's willing to ask. Why doesn't God reach all of them that way? Is that a legitimate question, yes or no? If the scriptures say he wants none to perish, and he's reached out to them through dreams, why does he just reach all of them that way? And you want to know the answer? I'll take that as a yes. <laughs> he gets more Lord. by using you than he does doing it himself. He gets more glory by a young person who's a sinner, who repents of their sins, starts to walk with God, gets discipled, learns to trust Him by faith, raises support, goes overseas, gets a job, learns a language, builds relationships, helps Muslims come to know Christ, and in that, leading multiple Muslims, gets them to trust each other and plants a church. He gets far more glory doing it that way than by doing it through dreams. And this is far more about revealing His glory than it is about Saving people. So God says, I've chosen to use people. Because that reveals my glory more. Now he's not handcuffed. So I can't reach anybody any other way else. No, he can reach people other ways. Dreams, signs, others. I can reach them all. No big deal. I'd rather use you. I'd rather use you for your sake and for my sake. Because hopefully you find out with future speakers, you learn far more stepping out in faith than you ever do staying in your comfort and your security. He wants you to step out for your sake, more than the Muslim sake, more than the Hindu sake, more than the Buddhist sake. So don't miss the big picture. God wants to use people. He wants to use you to reach nations. Well, okay, this Abrahamic covenant forms the foundation for a story that runs the entire way through the scriptures, like I said, railroad tracks. One rail the top line, one rail the bottom line, and you do it into the long haul, it becomes one story. If you're a cat, the only rail you walk on or ride on is the top line. If you're a dog, you balance out between the two. I want you to see how this top line, bottom line work their way throughout the text. Let's take, for example, the promised land. The promised land is a land flowing with what? You tell me. Refers to what part of the covenant? Top line of the covenant or the bottom line of the covenant? Top line of the covenant. Every top line blessing comes the bottom line what? Responsibility. responsibility. You know, I had no idea what the bottom line responsibility was to the promised land. I thought God had simply said to his people, Hey, you Israelites, you are my chosen people and I love you. And I tell you what, there is some prime real estate over there in the Middle East. I want you to have it. Go in there, kick all the other ites out of there, and you can settle in there and be my people. And that's all I thought there was to it. Until someone showed me the back of the Bible instead of maps. You know what I found out? A large majority of the major trading routes went right through the promised land. And if you're in what is now today Turkey, and you want to trade with that great powerhouse Egypt down in the south, it went right through the promised land. You're in now what is the uh, Iran, Iraq, the Stans. You want to trade with Egypt, you went right through the promised land. What was happening? Gentile after Gentile after Gentile coming through and saying, Hey, Mr. Jew, I'm on a very long journey and I'm bound before all the gods that I can see. So uh, where is your God that I might bow before him? I need a little extra luck. And the Jew would say, Mr. Gentile, you're out of luck. Why is that? You can't see our God. Oh, come on. Every other nation can see their God. We're not every other nation. What's the name of your God? Oh, he's got quite a few names. Come on, we buy some coffee. So we take out all the names of God. His name is Jehovah Jireh. Your God really tells you, he takes care of you, he fulfills all your needs. Yeah. Last crop season, our year of Jubilee, we took off the entire crop, didn't plant anything. We took the whole year off, and we still have a great new trade with your king. His name is the Lord our righteousness. Your God gives you righteousness. That's right. What was happening? They were witnessing the Gentile after Gentile after Gentile as they came to. No wonder Ezekiel 5 5 says, This is what the sovereign Lord says. This is Jerusalem, which I have set in the what? Center of the nations. The bottom line. Was it a land flowing with milk and honey? Absolutely. Top line blessings. Bottom line responsibilities. They were to be witnessing to all the nations who came to dream. 
Well, again, I want you to see this top line, bottom line all throughout the text. When I was a child growing up in Murraysville, Pennsylvania, my senior pastor always quoted Psalm 67, verse 1, to end the service. He'd get down as the organist was playing the last hymn. He'd turn around and he'd say, may God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face shine upon us. And then he always said the word, I did perfectly with the organist. I don't know how I did it. <laughs> but I grew up wanting God to be gracious to me. I grew up wanting God to bless me. I grew up wanting God's face to shine upon me. But my pastor never read the second verse. He never told me why God wanted to be gracious to me, why he wanted to bless me, why he wanted his face to shine upon me. May God be gracious to us, bless us, make his face shine upon us. Top line, top line, top line. Verse 1. <coughs> verse 2. That your ways may be known on earth, your salvation among where? How many nations? All. All nations. Why does God want to bless you? Why does He want His face to shine upon you? Why does He want to be gracious to you? Not so you can simply sit back in your soft, comfortable, cushiony chair saying, Oh, praise the Lord, I have been blessed. This is great. That's not incorrect, but it's grossly incomplete. He wants you turning around and reaching international students that He's brought to your backyard. He wants you going short term. He wants you going long term. He wants you doing inner city ministry. He wants you reaching out for his country. The bottom line to Psalm 67. All nations filled by the Old Testament. I don't have time to do any justice to it. We've got about, oh, I don't know how much time, a half an hour left or so. But anyhow, we're going to fly through a couple passages. Look at this, First Chronicles 16. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Proclaim his salvation day after day. Declare his glory among the nations. His marvelous deeds among all peoples. Declare His glory among the nations. There's the Great Commission. It doesn't get any clearer than that. And that's in the Old Testament. Psalm 72, 11. All kings will bow down to Him and all nations will serve Him. Jeremiah 3. At that time they will call Jerusalem the throne of the Lord and all nations will gather in Jerusalem to honor the name of the Lord. Daniel 7, at the very bottom in white. All peoples, nations, and men of every language worship Him. From that great Italian prophet Malachi, my name will be great among the nations from the rising to the setting of the sun. In every place, incense and pure rocks brought to my name because my name will be great among the nations, says the Lord Almighty. Listen, the Old Testament is filled with God's heart to reach the nations. I don't have any time to do any justice to it. But in this next slide, you're going to see a video clip. And in this video clip, I have highlighted all the passages of my Bible that are bottom line. I've not highlighted any top line verses. There's no God bless me verses highlighted in my Bible. Only bottom line verses. And I'm not even going to flip through the New Testament. I'm going to start at the end of the Old Testament. And I want you to see. Right there. Malachi, right there. Oh, great commission, great commission, great commission. Great commission, great commission, great commission, great commission, great commission, great commission. Great commission up here. Great commission down there. Down there. Look at all that great commission. Look at all. Look at how much is highlighted. Why is so much highlighted? One book. One story. One theme. God with an unending desire to reveal His greatest glory chose to create diversity. Immediately after it was created, He made a commitment to redeem people from every group of them. Okay, well, let's ask this question. Did Jesus understand the Abrahamic covenant to be the foundational starting point for the Scriptures? Or did He walk up to His disciples and say, Look, guys, you want to know why it's called the Old Testament? It's because it's old. It's outdated. I've been sent here to give some new insights, some new revelations. We'll write a new book. It'll be a bestseller. Is that what Jesus did? Or did He firmly understand the Abrahamic covenant as being the foundational starting point? Our answer is found in Luke 24 verse 45, viewing it in its context. Here in the context, Jesus has suffered on his earth. He has now risen from the dead. Now that he has risen from the dead, he is with his disciples, opening up their eyes to understand the scriptures. Luke 24 verse 45. Then he, he being Jesus, opened their minds, the minds of the disciples, so they could understand the scriptures. Now let's stop right there. Don't you wish they had tape recorders back in those days? To hear the living God of the universe explain the scriptures? Oh, how that would set some theology straight today. 
Obviously, Jesus had a limited amount of time. He had to go be with the Father. With that limited amount of time, he certainly must have broken the stream into the basic, the, the scriptures down to the basic themes or nutshells. How many themes did Jesus have to address in order to do justice to the scriptures? Well, if we were to list some major themes on, a, on a overhead, whatever, sanctification, justification, grace, mercy, holiness, second, we could probably come up with 15 or 20 major themes. Luke says, no. Jesus took the entire scriptures and he broke them down into two simple central themes. Now let's be real honest. If Jesus can take the entire scriptures and break them down into two simple central themes, should you and I be intimately acquainted with those themes, yes or no? Yeah. Should we be teaching those themes to others around us who are allowed to influence, yes or no? Yeah. Let's find out what those themes are. He told them this is what is written. The Christ will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations beginning in Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. And then he goes and talks about the future that's going to take place. You are witnesses of these things. Witnesses of what things? Witnesses of the fact that Jesus took the entire scriptures and he broke them down into two simple basic parts. Number one, he would suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. Which talks about the power over death. Which talks about the forgiveness of sins. Which talks about a relationship that we can now have with God the Father. Which seems to refer to which part of the covenant? Top line or bottom what do you think? Relationship with God the Father. Top line or bottom line? Top line of the covenant. That's right. He then turns around and says, Repentance and forgiveness of sins should be preached in His name to where? Oh. Referring to what part of the covenant? Oh. The bottom line. Jesus broke the entire scriptures down into top line, bottom line components or theology, if we may use those words. Do you realize what this means? It means the next time somebody sees you at church or at school or at the mall or wherever and says, Hey, you're pretty religious. Uh, what's the Bible all about? <laughs> now you have a short, succinct answer. Do you want to know? Yes, that's why I asked. Two things. No, the whole Bible. What's the whole Bible? Two things, really. What are they? Well, number one, God wants to reveal His glory by blessing you. And number two, He wants you to take that glory and spread it to all the nations. That is what our Bible is all about. It's really true. Let's put it to a test. There was an expert in the law. That expert in the law walked up to Jesus and said, Jesus, what is the greatest and foremost of all the commands? How many answers is that expert looking for? One. How many did Jesus give him? The first is you shall what? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and friend, what part of the covenant? Top line of the covenant. Next is you show what? Referring to the bottom line of the covenant. Jesus said, I'm sorry, I can't break the scripture down to one commandment, two. Now two I can do. Top line, bottom line. Oh, okay, let's give it another test. A little bit more basic. Ten commandments. The first four commands deal with the relationship with whom? God referring to what part of the covenant? Top line, the next six deal with our relationship with whom? Referring to the Top line, bottom line, top line, bottom line, top line, bottom line, top line, bottom line, top line, all the way through the scriptures, one story. There are over 400 paraphrases or abridgments of the Abrahamic covenant found throughout the scriptures, and they have the two parts. God wants to bless us, or to be a blessing to the nations. Well, let's understand, let's ask this question. When Jesus opened their eyes to understand the scriptures, the text says in Luke 24, verse 45, when he opened up their eyes with his disciples to explain the scriptures, do you think he opened up their eyes to the New Testament only, or the New and Old Testament together, or only the Old Testament? This is audience participation time. You've got to vote. How many say New Testament only? Let me see your hands. How many say New and Old Testament together? Let me see your hands. Put them up high, guys, watch how many say Old Testament only? You see your hands. Okay, some of you didn't vote. But those of you who are doing Old Testament together are definitely wrong. Why? Because the New Testament hadn't even been written. No, it was a trick question. But a trick question that drives some a point. What point does it drive home? Jesus with his disciples brought out the Old Testament scrolls. When he brought out the Old Testament scrolls, he proved two things. Number one, he would suffer and rise from the death on the third day. And number two, repentance and forgiveness of sins should be preached to where? 
Jesus through the Great Commission from where? The Old Testament. Men and women. The Great Commission was 2,000 years old when Jesus came on the scene. It is 4,000 years old today. Now, for those of you who think that a promise that God made to a man called Abraham 4,000 years ago has any bearing on life today, let me remind you that to the Lord, a thousand years is like a day. Therefore, God made this promise four days ago. <laughs> it is fresh on his mind. He's going to fulfill it. Well, let's go to the conclusion and peek in the back of the book. Let's find out how the story ends. Revelation chapter 5, verse 9, we have a song being sung by the elders and the living creatures. Now, if the elders are singing the song, it's got to be very important. Can you imagine the elders of your church getting up front and singing you guys a song? Okay, wouldn't that have to be an important song that would do that? So if it is so important, you better memorize the words, because to get to heaven, there are no LCD projectors in heaven. You need to hear the words. Hear the words. Don't drink while you're laughing. <laughs> and they sang a new song. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain. And with your blood you purchased men for God from just about every tribe and language and people and nation. Is that what it says? No. What does it say? Every tribe, language, people, and nation. You know what that means? It means here in Genesis chapter 12, God made a promise. To you, Abraham, all peoples on earth shall be blessed. Here in Revelation 5, 9, he fulfills the promise by redeeming people from every tongue, every tribe, and every nation. Here's the promise. Here's the fulfillment. Promise, fulfillment, promise, fulfillment. Everything in between is the story. The story of his glory. But if your friend dragged you here tonight and you realize this is all about missions and you're really not into missions, may I encourage you to put your thumb firmly in Genesis 12, your four fingers on Revelation chapter 5, verse 9, and take missions out of the Bible. All of a sudden, Bible study just got a whole lot easier. <laughs> it's just 11 chapters. You can now read through the Bible in a year. One a month with December off. Because everything else is missions. You can't take missions out of the Bible. Missions is the Bible. It's God's heart. Always has been. Always will be. What God set out to do in the very beginning of the Bible God pulls off at the very end of time. He made a promise right after the diversity was created. He fulfilled that promise, uniting all diversity together. How foundational and significant is the story of the Bible? Well, now maybe you'll understand the words of Jesus a little bit better when he, in speaking about the future things to come, said these words. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testament to where? All nations in the Greek, pantata ethne, all ethnic groups, every group that calls us, us, and the other thems. This gospel shall be preached in the whole world to all ethnic groups. And then the end shall come. And then the end shall come. Men and women, my brother. When he was an elder in Presbyterian Church, large Presbyterian Church in, in uh, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, erroneously thought that we're supposed to be doing, we're supposed to be Christians doing good things, but basically we're twiddling our thumbs waiting for Jesus to come back. Not at all close to the truth. We have a job to do before Christ comes back. This and six other passages back it up. Why? Why would God be so concerned about reaching all the nations earth, all the nations first before the end came? Two reasons. Reason number one: 
If God did not reach all the nations first before his son came back, he would have broken a promise to Abraham and he would be called what for all eternity? A liar. Not going to allow that to happen. Secondly, and far more importantly, if we got there and we were all worshiping God except three people groups, he would not reveal his greatest glory. He would not reveal his greatest glory. He could have been a little bit better. But hey, it's okay, God. We forgive you. Not going to happen. We, the church, have a job to do. We, as individuals, have got a story to plug into. Your life is not some random happenstance and you just kind of get to do whatever you want here on this earth. God says, no. I gave you a job to do. I gave you a job to do. I blessed you for a purpose. I want you to turn around and be a blessing to all the nations. I do that for my greatest glory, but also for your greatest joy. That's why I want you involved. Our Bibles are meant to be read as one book. One introduction, one story, and one conclusion. But there's a warning. It's a lot easier to focus in on one part of the covenant over the other. Which part of the covenant is it the easiest to focus in on? The top line or the bottom line? Top line of the covenant, that's right. That's right. I want to challenge you that most Christians are only focused on the top line. How about you? I want to see how you guys do. I'm going to give you my bottom line test. It's a test that I give all over the globe as I travel and speak, and it deals in the area of Scripture memory. I'm going to say the beginning of a verse. I want you to fill in the rest of the verse. Mm -hmm. Depending on how you fill in the rest of the verse will help you determine whether or not you're focused more on the top line of the covenant or the bottom line of the covenant. Not before your palms get all sweaty. It's, oh, man, I wish I'd done that Scripture memory verse. I should have been a navigator growing up. Don't worry about it. If you know it, just say it out loud. and don't just be quiet. They're already walking out of the room. But that's okay. <laughs> Anyhow, I want you to see how you do. Ready? Here we go. If you know it, say it out loud. If you don't, just be quiet. Everybody, here we go. Fill in the rest of this verse. Be still and? <laughs> know that I am God. Come into my presence. Know me. Worship me. <laughs> Refers to which part of the covenant? Top line or bottom line? Top line of the covenant. And if you don't realize it, you all flunked. Why? You just quoted me Psalm 46, verse 10, 8, the first third of the verse. Be still and know that I am God, that I will be exalted among the nations, I will be exalted in the earth, the rest of Psalm 46, verse 10. But you know, it's quite possible that you just like me. When I became a Christian my freshman year at Penn State University, I got my brand new little Bible. When I got my brand new little Bible, I forgot to differentiate between my Bible and my yearbook. Guess what the first thing that I did when I got my yearbook in high school? What was the first thing I did? I looked for my own picture all the way through. That's how I read my Bible. I opened up my Bible and I asked one simple question. Where am I in this? What's God got in this for me? For God so loved Bob Shogun that he gave his only begotten son and if I should believe in him, I should not perish, I should have everlasting life. His yoke is easy, his burden is light. I like this Christian unity. And without realizing it, oh, I should have paid half price for my Bible. Why? I was only reading half of God's word. I was only reading half of God's word. I'd go to Psalm, verses like Psalm 46, verse 10. I'd highlight the top line. I'd memorize the top line. I'd go looking for my next top line verse. I have no idea I was passing over. Bottom line after bottom line after bottom line. I memorized Psalm 46, verse 10. I thought, no, I only went memorized Psalm 46, verse 10a. And I skipped over the bottom line. And I'm fully convinced, firmly convinced, most Christians only read half of their Bibles. They're focused on what I call yearbook meology. A yearbook meology. This is where am I in the Bible? What's God got in this for me? Let me give some examples. Daniel in the lion's den. What's the lesson we learn in Sunday school about Daniel in the lion's den? 
You all know this. What is it? What's the lesson we learned? Trusting God in what? He'll take care of you. It's true. It's real. It's top line. It's not incorrect. It's incomplete. What's the bottom line to Daniel and Weinstein? I had no idea. And you know what? I didn't care. Why? Because I found out how the story applied to me. And that's all I was worried about was me. I was worried about God. But sure enough, the king finds out who the bad guys are. Pulls the bad guys out. Or pulls Daniel out, throws the bad guys in. And then we read these words. Then King Darius wrote to whom? All the peoples, nations, men, and language throughout the land. May you prosper greatly. I issue a decree in every part of my kingdom. People must fear and reverence the God of Daniel. What's happening? You got a Gentile king who saw the glory of God. He was so impressed with it. Takes his phone out. He tweets all the other kings on the earth. Worship the God of Daniel. What's the bottom line lesson? Internationals are going to be so impressed with how God takes care of you. They're going to go tell other internationals about your God. Bottom line application. Get involved with internationals living around you and let them see your life. Now, let me, uh, let me ask you a question. How many of you were ever taught the bottom line to David and Goliath? I'm sorry, to Daniel and the lions then. <laughs> How many of you were ever taught the bottom line to Daniel and the lions then ever in your lifetime? If, if you were taught the bottom line of Daniel and the Lions, the priority of reaching international students at any time in your Christian life through Daniel and would you please stand up at this point in time? No. Stand up, literally. Stand up right now if you've ever been taught the bottom line of Daniel and the Lions. What's it tell you? The majority of what you have learned up to this point is not incorrect, but it is incomplete. Men and women, you may have a whole nother half of your Bible you have yet to discover. You name story after story after story. If I had more time, we'd go through every one of these stories. Every one of these major stories has a bottom line component to it. Most Christians have no idea. They don't know where to find it. So being the nice guy that I was, I put the actual chapter where you could find it. So I would have you go through it and look for it. Even about five minutes. And many of you would struggle with it. And there's a reason why you would struggle with it. Let me tell you why. Back in the 1970s, we were taught something very unique in the Christian life. And it was called personal application. When you study your Bible, look for personal application. How does this apply to you? It's not incorrect, but it's incomplete. We were never taught to ask the question, what does God get out of this? How does this reflect His glory? And we miss so much. <coughs> and so I have groups that go through this and they, and they, they miss it. I, I didn't see it. I, I, don't, I don't. Finally, they begin to get it. And then once they get it, I say, okay, let me ask you another question now. How does this, I give them the answers, they all write down the answers, and I said, how is this, what's the bottom line lesson? Now go through every one of these and find the bottom line lesson. And then I ask them, how does that apply to your life? And so they struggle and wrestle. How does this apply to my life? And most of them can't do it. They can't do it. Because they've never been taught to look for the bottom line and try to figure out how it applies to their lives. Now we're basically out of time. We're going to go through just a couple of them real quickly. David and Goliath. David and Goliath. You all know the story of David and Goliath. David is out obeying his father. His father says, go out and get some cheeseburgers for your brothers. Get some goodies and dollars. Runs back out to the field, sees the giant, and says, who is this guy? How could he taunt the armies of Israel? And so he convinces them to go out and allow them to go out. So he goes out and he comes against them. He comes against the Goliath and he says this in 1 Samuel 17, 45 and 47. He says, you come against the Lord of the armies of the host of Israel. But this day, I'll take off your spear. I'll cut off your head. I'll give your carcasses to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. And the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. How is the whole world going to know there was a God in Israel? How is the word going to get out? Through the traitors. Coming from all the nations. 
You bet every time someone came through right after that, they got some free coffee. Thank you. It's hanging on our boy David. Oh, yeah, sure. What do you do? Took on a giant. Are you kidding? Yeah, I heard something about this. Tell me more. Who got credit? David or the God of Israel? The God of Israel. God's reputation began to go up as that trader went from water and water to water, you know, telling the story, passing the story along. The whole world will know there's a God of Israel. What's the bottom line? Lesson. Take on giants for God's glory to go global. Take on giants for God's glory to go global. Okay, let me ask you a question. What are some giants our churches could be taking on today? Not rhetorical, give me some answers. What are some giants our churches could be taking on today? Abortion, good. What else? Homosexuality, human trafficking, good. What else? Poverty, homelessness. How about planning a church in an unreached people group or an unengaged people group? Would that be a giant for your church, yes or no? Okay, now let's think through this. Let's imagine your church, I don't care what size, whether it's, it's 400 or 4,000 or 40,000. Let's suppose your church, your elders get together and, and they decide we want to plant a church, we want to take on a giant, and we're going we're gonna to try to plant a church among a Muslim, unengaged people group in northern India. One to five million ratio. Okay, and so they go before God, and let's just say they're a church of 400, and they pray, God, we're a church of 400, we're small, and we don't have any finances, but God, we want you to use us to plant a daughter church among a Muslim people group in northern India. An unengaged people group. Is God going to, A, fall off his throne laughing, saying, you think you can do what? Or B, say, I've been waiting for you to pray a God-sized prayer for decades. I'll be behind you a thousand percent. Which do you think would be, hear me? B. Most churches don't do it. Why? The carbon in the top line. How can God minister to our people? How can we help our marriages? How can we help our families? Those aren't bad questions. They're just very incomplete. And they're missing so much. Why is it that C dead? All input, no outlet. All top line, no bottom line. Our churches are dying. They're dying in the blessings. They've caught the Christian cold. What's the Christian cold? I choose. God bless me. I choose. God bless me. I choose. God bless me. God bless me. God bless me. God bless me. We're dying in the blessings. Esther. You all know the story of Esther? The king throws a party, asks this queen to come out. She snubs him. He says, honey, you're no longer queen. He says, there are tryouts. Esther tries out. She becomes the queen. There's a bad guy, Haman. He wants to kill all the Jews. And uh, so he goes, hey, king, how about if we kill all these dirty Jews? He says, sure, why not? Puts a signature on it. Esther finds out about it through her uncle. And her uncle Mordecai says, you need to go talk to the king. So she goes and talks to the king unannounced. She had a 50-50 chance of being killed. She goes in there. The king says, honey, how are you? What would you like to have my kingdom? She says, uh, King, I'm a Jew, and uh, my people are going to be killed, so would you mind if our people kill the other people like the day before? Is that all right? Yes, I grant it. And then you read in Esther chapter 8, verse 17. There was rejoicing and celebrating among the Jews, and many people from other nationalities became God-fearing Jews. <gasps> Esther took a step of faith, and in that step, she touched nations. Bottom line lesson, take a step of faith. Even if it could mean dying, even if it means you've got a 50-50 chance, God will be with you. How does that apply to our lives? What are some steps of faith you could take to really literally put your life on the line? What could you do? Nobody wants to put their life on the line? 
But what could you do? It's not saying you're going to do it. What could you do? Go to people who've seen any be persecuted. Absolutely. If you hear there are needs in Afghanistan, in Yemen, in Pakistan, China, you don't say, oh, I'm not going to go because it's not safe. No. That's what a cat says. I'm worried about me and my safety. A dog says, if God's glory is not shining there, we should go. We should take God's glory there. Step out in faith, bottom line, that's true. The first missionary, Genesis chapter 12. Who was the first missionary in the Bible? Anybody know who was in Genesis chapter 12? Abraham. Abraham. He went down to Egypt. What got Abraham to go down to Egypt? God said, I want you to go to all nations. Abraham didn't go. So God said, okay, I'll send you. He sends Abraham to Egypt. How did he send Abraham to Egypt? There was a famine in the land. Genesis chapter 12, verse 10. There was a famine in the land, and Abraham went down to Egypt. How did Abraham do as a missionary? Terrible. She's my sister. Ooh, sister. Did a terrible job. God gave him multiple opportunities. He finally, he finally did okay as a, as a missionary. What does it tell you? What's the bottom line lesson? God can arrange circumstances in your life that will force you to take His glory to other people's. Bottom line application. Men and women, do not be surprised at all if there is a total economic collapse of the United States. We are $17.2 trillion in debt. China is $13 trillion in the black. And if they ever call our notes, we're dead. Total collapse. What will people have to do and what will Christians have to do to find jobs? Go somewhere else. Overseas. Many of us to China. And what will God have done? Forced us. It's called God's involuntary go mechanism. He will have forced us to go to the nations. Because he said, I want you to go. I wanted you to do it voluntarily. But if you're not going to volunteer, I'll send you. Bottom line lesson and application to Genesis 12. Hey, listen. How did they get involved? How did, how did David, when he first saw the light, what got him involved? He just what? He was zealous. He saw a need and he zealously acted for God's reputation. Esther, how did she get involved? Her, she was challenged to act by her uncle. Abram, how did he get involved? Circumstances forced him. Okay? Everybody, now put your eyes on the screen. Everybody, eyes on the screen. None of them had a call. You have God's heart from Genesis 12 to Revelation 5 his desire to redeem people from every tongue, tribe, and nation and you think you need a call? My friend was called. Yeah, God does call some people. But the majority of people in the book of Acts got overseas due to persecution. The majority of them got to receive due to persecution. You don't need to call. Let me ask this question. In fact, Renee, is Renee here? Yes. How long do I have to? It's 8.46 by my watch. Till so five minutes till. Till five minutes till. Get together with one person right next to you. One person. Two at the most. And answer this question. How could missing half of your Bible affect knowing God's will for your life? If you're only reading half of your Bible, how could that affect knowing God's will for your life? You get one minute. Go talk to it with somebody else.
Okay, let's come back together as a group. How could it affect knowing God's will for your life? Nobody wants to be second, or first, so who wants to be second? So give me some answers. Yes, sir. Our focus is on ourselves, therefore, how does it affect knowing God's will? You miss it. What else? It'll keep me from it. What else? I don't what? If you're not reading the Bible, you don't want to. Therefore, you won't know God's will for your life. It's nice to be still and know who God is. Just sit there and, and just hang out. And so you'll never know God's will for your life. Anybody else? How will we know where to go? Because we're looking for our glory, not His glory. How can I, how can my church be blessed? What can God do for our church? So it's all about our church being blessed. And we're missing the amazing things that God may have for our church to do, which wouldn't show us a blessing. Uh, you know, always I've got a, a, a churches that we, we just want to end and we just want to trust you, God, to bless our church. I'd love a pastor to say, Lord, we want to trust you to bless the church down the road. Most pastors don't pray that. Why? Because if the church down the road gets blessed, people will start going there. I don't want them to go there. I want them to go here. Therefore, we pray for God's blessing here, not there. It's not about his kingdom. It's about our kingdom, our church, our ministry. Men and women, you name story after story after story in the Bible. I bet you everybody here knows the top line lesson. And you may struggle to know the bottom line. But it's one story. There's an introduction. Sorry. There's an introduction. There's a story. And there's a conclusion. Here he creates diversity. Here he unifies it together. And everything between is the story of his glory. Don't forget the big picture. What's God doing? He wants to reveal His. That we might have the Greatest joy. Greatest glory. Greatest joy. Men and women. Focus on the screen. This is something worth living for. This is something worth. This is something worth dying for. This is something worth living for. Something worth suffering for. Something worth dying for. You'll find it in this book, God's Bottom Line. Discover your global role in His global plan, fresh off the press. It's right over here. Now listen, how many of you would like to teach what I just taught tonight? Anybody here? Okay. I created something for you. It's called You Teach. You Teach the Story of the Bible. Four PowerPoints. Creative PowerPoint. They're actually PDFs that are exported. But the slides you see sent out in PDF form where you can teach this. I've got the files. I've got what to say on every slide. I've got an audio example for you. The story of the Bible and the first lecture, the other side of the cross. I can't go and look at the other side of the cross. These are here for you. I forgot to put them out and talk about them, but they're, they're available if you want to learn how to teach this. Do we have our memory cards? You want to start getting some volunteers to pass those out, please? What I've got for you are two cards. It's just a four by six picture that I created on my computer, but it allows you to memorize all the major points of everything that I've talked about. All the major points of everything that we're going through. So those are going to get passed out. I want you to start looking at those and studying those for just a minute or two. And while those are being passed out, also look on the screen again. For those of you who don't believe anything unless you watch it on television, this talk is in DVD form called The Story of the Bible, designed for Sunday schools, home groups, small group Bible studies, whatever. Eight 45-minute lectures on the story of the Bible with me giving it. Again, also that you teach. That's available there. And again, if you've got a heart for missions and you don't love kids, uh, I heard good news today. The 93 short two-minute stories. Okay, so you should be getting two cards. And um, grab those cards, and one of them uh, has the other side of the cross and has some cat and dog stuff in it. You're not going to have everything there on these cards. Uh, uh, you're not going to recognize everything, but you should recognize a majority of it. And then the other card would be the story of the Bible. What you're supposed to be doing, you should have two cards. One uh, is the story of the Bible. Who does not have the story of the Bible? Let me see your hands. Front row doesn't have story of the Bible. These don't have story of the Bible. Right here, story of the Bible. 
Anybody else not have a story of the Bible? It's got a picture of the Bible that I've been showing up here all the time. Okay, anybody not have the other side of the cross? A couple of people right here do not have the other side of the cross. Who else does not have the other side of the cross? A couple of people right over here. Back rows over there. Okay, these four by six cards are designed to be put in your Bible so that when you open up your Bible, it falls on the floor. And you say, darn it, why did this guy want me to put my Bible? You pick it back up and you look at it and you say, oh yeah. Oh yeah, is my quiet time going to be about me? Or is it going to be about God? Am I only going to focus on the top line? Or am I going to focus on the bottom line? Is it going to be about suffering? Am I willing to suffer? Or am I going to try to avoid it? Suffering and the Great Commission, the story of the Bible, four thousand years old. Oh yeah, I remember that. And what's the phone there for? What's the phone signifying? The story of the Bible. One? You don't need a personal call from God to get involved with what He is doing. And what are the, on the right side of the Bible that corresponds with no call? What's that one? You may not know God's will if you're only reading half of your Bible. If you're only focusing on one half of what God is doing. Okay. Any questions, thoughts, comments before I sign off? Reference to time management. Oh, if you go on our website, unveilingglory.com, there is a ton of free teaching. A ton of free teaching you can get on that. Uh, that's just one sample of the free teaching of me. I don't even need, I don't even need your email address. You just go on there and you can multiple 20-minute lessons where you can just learn. Learn. That was the specific time management. I can't remember. I created so many of them. I'm sure that. But I'm sure it was really good. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, where's the click or the sign up? Is there anybody that did not get it? Oh uh, my whole hat. Oh my gosh, the majority of people here. Let's just put it, hey, can you just put it out there on a stand or something? Grab a stand so people can sign up uh, if they want and get one of our prayer cards on the table. It's on the table outside where you register. Uh, we can get it. Renee, are you want to you, you want to stop? You want to close this here before people are already getting ready to leave? All right. Thank you, Paul. How about giving it up for Bob?